We're going live in New Mexico. And uh, exciting topic. What Jesus said when he was talking to his disciples to go fishing on a regular basis. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So before we go fishing sometimes,
So we have revival. It starts tomorrow night, 6.30. We have a new banner coming out. If you want to show the viewers our banner, it's, it's got our logo on it, revival nightly, 6.30 p.m., Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. So if you can come out, we're going to get fired up. We're going to talk about some things. Pastor Evangelist Stan Lovins is flying in from Nashville. He's actually been preaching today, I think, in Indianapolis, but he's flying at midnight in Albuquerque with his partner, Kevin. There's a few other guys that are scheduled to be here. We have folks coming in from California, and uh, we have a team. We're actually going to be videotaping what we do at, for a documentary as far as a Navajo outreach. So we created some flyers, and these are our flyers we're going to show our viewers. Revivals for Jesus is the ministry. If you want to check out their website, it's revivalsforjesus.com. That's a picture of Stan Lovins. And uh, basically, it's part of our Navajo Nation outreach. As you guys know, Navajo Ministries, now Four Corners Home for Children, uh, 69 years in this area has always taken care of children, but part of their ministry is a Navajo Nation outreach. And it's sometimes it's, just, it's been from Navajo tours to Christmas time, getting food, blankets, pinto beans, gifts, presents, medicine, uh, all kinds of uh, toiletries, and bringing them out to reservation pastors. And now there's usually about 25 churches that come and pick them up. We have a storehouse. But anyway, we're expanding our Navajo Nation outreach to try to reach these nations with the good news of Jesus Christ, also teach them how to do celebrate recovery, to deal, deal with addiction issues. It's a great program. We've been doing it here on Wednesday nights. But Stan Lovins is a true evangelist. I did an interview with him uh, at NRB in March. And I said, hey, what would it look like if Revivals of Jesus came out to reach the Navajo Nation? So we coordinated this trip, and uh, we're going to be doing this all week. As you can see, the one on the left is Fruitland. We're starting here. If we're going to do a revival, it starts in God's house, our house first. We get pumped up, and then we're going to break down the tent. It takes four hours of setup, two hours of breakdown. And on Friday, we're gonna, we have a spot in Gallup, 1805 West U.S. Road 66. And we're going to do a revival in Gallup Friday night, Saturday night. So we'll need help, we'll need hands. And then we're even, on Saturday in the morning, we're going to go to the Gallup flea market and just mix and mingle with people and look and pray for opportunities to share and talk about Jesus. That's the good news. The good news is that God loves His Son. He gave us Jesus. So we're trying to find people who haven't received Him yet and try to convince them into asking God and, and receiving Christ, you know, being born again. You know, we'll talk about that. So... He specializes at doing altar calls. So part of this revival as well is this baseball clinic. So Stan Lovins played for four minor league baseball teams in his career, and he knows a lot about baseball. So when he does these revivals overseas, he goes to countries they've never even seen a baseball. And they've had a 1,000 kids show up, and they're showing them the baseball, and they're teaching baseball, and then he teaches all the kids. He shares the gospel. And he said the last time, we're out of 1,000 children, Chuck, you know how many kids received Christ? I said, I don't know, uh, a couple hundred? He said, all 1,000. Then they go home and they tell their parents, hey, I learned about baseball and I learned about this Jesus. And then they come, his parent, the parents come to the revival that night. So they're sharing the gospel with his kids, teaching them baseball. Mm -hmm. The kids love games and baseball, but it's practical skills. It's a baseball county uh, city. So I told them, hey, this is great. So we rented out Strike Zone. We negotiated a deal with them uh, to rent out the place Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And uh, so we've been posting these and sharing these on social media. So we have flyers now, back to me. So we have flyers, and we call these seeds. And as the Spirit prompts you to say something, I've already done it this morning at Walmart on the way here. I mentioned revivals. Eyes went up. Yesterday, Annette and I went to, to, to lunch at Riverside uh, Cafe. And the owner there has been blessing our children's home with pizza night once a month. But the waitress, when I mentioned revival, her eyes went up. She said, my sister's been looking for a revival. So boom, texted her just an image of the link. She texted back, God bless you guys. I was telling her about Jeremiah 333, because her phone number had 333 in it. And I don't know if I shared it with you guys, but that right as I was pulling in, after 2,240 miles, I'm on Murray, making a left at Speedway on Murray to come in home, and this big old bus is in front of me, one vision, one mission, and the license plate had my 2-3 for my birthday. I had a nickel for every time I see out 2-3 this week. 333-G for God. That's the license plate on this van, on this giant bus. As I'm pulling in, he hooks the left. And then we're on, on West Main Street. He hooks another left. And he actually escorts me into my property. And you guys know me with my 333, Jeremiah 333. I'm just seeing it everywhere. And out of a 32-hour road trip... 
all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, and to land here Thursday afternoon at 6 p.m. that God would have this bus right in front of me. For me to see this sign, I felt like it was just for me. But it all starts with that, Jeremiah 33, 3. It starts in verse 2 where he says, The Lord who formed it, the Lord who made it, the Lord who established it, the Lord is his name. And then he goes into verse 3. He says, Call to me, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you don't know. And we believe that God is all-knowing and I'm not. And the more I call out to him, the more he's showing me stuff. So that's just a simple message to anybody. You look up and say, God, show me you. He will reveal himself to you in all kinds of ways. He'll blow your mind. What do I need to know? If your children ever asked a parent, Mom, Dad, what do you think I need to know? They got a list, a, a long list of things that you, think you, that you think you know and what you need to know based on where you're at and what you're doing today. God is the same way as a father to his children. He wants to speak to you. So with that being said, we're going to get into revival this week. So what, what is revival? It's not a born-again experience because revival means if something is dead, to revive it and bring it back to life. So if you're getting born again for the first time, that's a born again experience. That's like evangelistic works that's, that's receiving salvation. But if you're in a church, it's very possible that you've gotten lukewarm, you might even gotten cold. The people here got up early today to be here, but there may be somebody who's watching online who hasn't been to church yet, been to church lately, may not even have prayed lately. But their spirit, their faith is dead. So we're hoping, what happens when the heart stops beating? What, what do they do in the hospital? They take those little two little pads, they rub them together, clear, tunk, they try to get that heart going again, right? They, they jolt the heart, try to get the heart beating. If they're choking and they do CPR on someone, anybody ever have to do CPR on somebody? Why would somebody have to do CPR on somebody? They stop breathing and their heart starts beating, you're trying to bring them back to life, right? Well, sometimes in our faith, our faith has become dead. James says, Faith without works is dead. It's not, it's not effective. It's not, if you need to tell somebody who's hungry and who doesn't have something to eat, hey, be warm, be blessed, and you don't do anything to help meet their urgent needs, what does that do besides upset them? So along the way, because of your faith, Paul goes on to say, uh, I'll show you my faith by my works. The things I do are because I'm doing them by faith. God said to do it, I do it. Whether I'm not expecting any kind of results, all I know is God put on my heart to do something. I'm going to step out of the boat. I'm going to do it. So as believers, we keep our ears open. What is God asking you to do today? Do you even ask God, hey, what do you want me to do today? I wake up with a list of ten things I want to do. And I just start doing them. And I even get convicted, hey, when these look like good things, but is this really what God wants me to do today with my time, my treasure, my talent? So revival is really just a time to to get pumped up and get fired up to, to be all God calls you to be and to do what God calls you to do right where you're at and to keep following him. And that's what Jesus told his disciples at the beginning of the ministry. If you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. So I looked at a couple verses today. And we all know our country and our nation is in a world of hurt. Anybody think that our country needs to be healed of anything? Anybody needs our, thinks our country has fallen away from God? Um, there's still a lot of believers in this country, but sometimes when you look at the media and some of the things that they're, that they're debating, which does not line up with the heart of God, you think, man, our country needs a revival. Our government needs a revival. So this is a famous verse, 7 Chronicles 7, 14, kind of you can show our viewers. If, the key word, 14, if my people, my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. Who sitting here today thinks that this is what our formula, this is what we need in our country, inside of individual people? So there's a process here. I did some computer programming when I was in college, and it's called if-then statement. You may not know this, but when you run a computer, if you hit... If you press this letter, the program will do that. If I hit this button, the next slide will show up. If I hit the back button, then the next slide shows up. If I press any one of these buttons, then something else happens up here because it's been programmed to help run my PowerPoint slick. And God is starting off this with a big if. Because if you don't do this, this won't happen. You can also reverse this question. If you don't, call on his name, and you don't humble yourself, and you don't pray, and you don't seek your face, and you don't 
turn from your wicked ways, then he's not going to listen to you from heaven, and he won't forgive you of your sin, and he's not going to heal your land. That doesn't look good. That's why it's an if statement. And that's what, we're, that's what a call to repentance, a call to revival, maybe even just start with this one verse. If. And you know, a lot of people want to pray, but they don't want to change what they're doing. They may be practicing a particular sin. They could be stealing from their boss. They could be fudging the numbers here, fudging the numbers here. They could be lying about something. Oh, God, please bless me today, and they're going to spend the rest of their day lying about something. Well, if you don't turn from your wicked ways, wicked means wrong. There is a right way, and there is a wrong way. We live in such a politically correct society today that you can't even say anything's wrong. I can, and I will. There's certain things that are clear in Scripture that are right and wrong. And if we're doing something wrong, the most loving thing that you can ever do is help someone see the error of their way and turn from the wrong way and start doing the right thing. Because it affects everybody. When I do something wrong, it affects me, my family, and everybody that's around me. They pay the consequences for my wrong decisions. And it's not like, oh, if it's right to you, if it feels good to you, it's right. No, that, that's the worst advice in the world. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart, above all things, the heart is desperately wicked. Who knows it? And he answers, the Lord knows your heart. But take a list of everything on the planet, and he says, above all things, the heart is desperately wicked. So if you're following your heart today, you can't trust your heart, but you can trust the Lord and his heart. And sometimes your heart and his heart aren't the same. And our, sometimes our prayer needs to be, Lord, give me your heart. I need a heart transplant. We know what a physical heart transplant looks like today. They cut open the chest, they rip it open, they put a new pump in, they zap it, and it starts pumping again. Now this person has a brand new heart, it's pumping blood through his body. Well, sometimes spiritually we need a heart transplant from God. God, give me your heart. How do you see things? How do you feel about things? Psalms 37.4 says, if you delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. So the more you delight in him and how awesome he is and how much he loves you and the mercy and grace that he's shown you, you're delighting in God, you start getting God's desires put in your heart. That's where the heart transplant starts. But it starts with getting reconciled to God, loving you, forgive me, I want to be with you, I want to be more like you, I want to show me what I need to know, I'm walking with you 24-7, practicing the presence of God. When you guys came here today, you knew who was in the car and you knew who, who you're in the presence of and when you, you, know, you, you act a certain way when you're in a certain group of people. Most people won't do things in this room that they might do when they're home when they're by themselves because there's somebody watching. And that's who you really are. That's who you are. When you're home alone and those things that you're doing, that's who you are. It's easy to act on your best behavior when there's people watching. But 24-7, that's the challenge, to be a Christian 24-7, to be Christ-like 24-7. But this is a formula, um, and Casting Crown is a great song, What If My People Prayed? Instead of asking Oprah what to do, we should ask God what we should do. That's one of the lines in the song. It's classic. What if my people prayed, dusted off their Bibles, their swords, and stormed hell's rusty gates? What if my people prayed? And in the song, they quote this verse. We'll move on to Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. That means set apart. Quote, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Does that sound like revival? And he reminds you who's talking. This is God. He dwells in heaven and He's also present here. His name is holy. Isaiah would go on to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I can preach on all three of those words. What Lord means, what God really means. Almighty. All-knowing, all-powerful, all-knowing. All-knowing, all-present, all... -knowing, all -powerful, all He's omnipresent. Um, he's everywhere. You, just, you can't escape the presence of God. But that's how Isaiah, he re repeated it three times. Holy, holy, holy. Man, you are holy. And that word holy means set apart. We need to be holy. Set apart, servants of God, different from the other people in the world. But if you notice, the word humble shows up in here too. You saw it in Chronicles. If we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, if we have a humble heart, well, what does that word humble really mean? Think about what Moses said. Moses in Scripture, he was the most humble man ever alive. 
Does that sound like a prideful statement? He was in charge. He was an over two or three million Israelites. He was leading them through the promised land. He was in charge of everybody, but he was still humble under God. So humble, humility, true humility is not talking bad about yourself. Oh, no good. I stink at this. I stink at that. You're, you could almost, you're borderline of insulting the Creator when you talk bad about His creation. So don't talk bad about yourself. You know, you can't over-talk yourself either when you're not really good at baseball and say, oh, I'm a great baseball star. I mean, that's, you know, and those everybody's like, it's really not that good. You know, so, I mean, you know, there's levels of, you know, boasting about yourself. We boast in the Lord. But having a sober assessment, the Bible says, have a sober assessment of who you are, a realistic view of who you are. I know I'm still a sinner saved by grace. I, I, I'm, I'm one second, one decision away from stupid. But, you know, I'm, I'm de defined more as a saint than a sinner without a savior. So, I mean, we all have the ability to, to make mistakes and, and to, to commit all kinds of sins, even as believers. Believers do stupid things all the time. But we have a gracious, merciful God. If it's not fatal and it doesn't take you out, He's willing to work with you and make you better and make you stronger for it. So, we learn a lot from our mistakes. But being humble, God realizes, you're up here, I'm, I'm down here. I'm a humble servant of the Lord. I, I know where my place God's up here. We're not equal. We're not buddy-buddy like this, although God does call us His friend. We still revere God. It's under the fear of the Lord. And it's not to be afraid of Him like we're afraid of a burglar. It's just that reverence and that awe of His holiness and his, how awesome and how powerful He is that He made me. He died for my sins. He rose again. He's power, that you know, un, unspeakable power. That's who we're talking about. So when you understand that you're under God and He's above all, uh, that's, that's a humble position. So Ephesians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 is one of our theme verses. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. Father over all who is in you all. And Paul was writing that to the church in Ephesus because they had received Christ. He's able, he was able to say to that whole church, God the Father who is over all and in you all. So he's not in everybody. The world doesn't have Christ in them. The believers have Him in them. And we've gone over this before. In, first, in John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, you know, in verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But verse 12 right there says, And those who received Him, He gave them the right to become children of God. So if you receive Christ, you're a child of God, you're a believer, you're in the church. And we just need to continue to humble ourselves, have that contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. So we need our spirits revived. We need some power. We need, some, so we need to get pumped up. If you're going into, you know, into a game or you've got a big exciting week, you get excited about it, you're going on vacation, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. There's certain things that excite you, that get you pumped up. Well, for me, it's seeing another life transformed by the power of God. He did it for me, He can do it for them. And there's a whole lot of people who need what we have and if we're just going to keep what we have and keep it in our pocket, that's pretty selfish. <laughs> it's like, uh, to me, it's a sin of omission. James says, to you who knows to do good and doesn't do good, it's sin to him. So we're obligated to, to share what we know about Jesus, not keep it in our pocket, pocket, pocket. It's not a private issue. Some people say, oh, my faith is private. Well, mine's very public. And I'm commanded by Jesus to share the gospel, the good news, with every living creature. And there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. So we're going to talk about that. And that's what a little bit of revival is. But with revival, there's also people that are getting pumped up again, and God loves to show up and show off. Stan Lovins, part of his ministry, everywhere he goes, there's healings and miracles. I don't see him as much, but God, in his ministry, there's, he was just telling me three nights ago, there was an old lady who had a couple rods in her back, some pins, and she's never been able to reach over and bend her toes. And by the time they were all done and worshiping God, this lady touched her toes and God did something. And the whole, the whole crowd noticed. And every time I see a miracle happen in the Bible, it's because there's a whole lot of unbelievers in the room. And God doesn't want people to be unbelieving. He wants them to be believing. He wants them to believe in Him, trust in Him, because if they do believe in Him and trust in Him, they're going to start talking more and their relationship's going to get better. 
right? It's part of this reconciliation thing. So a lot of times there'll be a messenger talking about the power and the love of God and Jesus and everything he's done. And there's a lot of skeptics in the room saying, I don't believe any of it. I've seen a bunch of stuff on TV. I've seen this and that. I've met a bunch of Christians. They're a bunch of flakes. They're blah, blah, blah. They've got a list a mile long of why they don't believe the message. And all of a sudden, boom, God shows up and does a miracle. Uh, I need to rethink this. All that I've heard about this amazing God, he just did something. He showed up. I can talk about lightning all day long, in a good way, bad way, whatever. Until you see lightning, you might not believe in lightning. Has anybody ever seen lightning before? Have you seen it strike a tree? Has it ever hit and so close? It was like, boom, at the same time, and lightning was like, whoa, it like shook your, you know, like, wow. I had a tree across my house, hit, lightning hit it, took a big branch out, and they put a little tar on the side, and as kids, every day I would go outside, I'd look at that tree, and I'd go, I remember lightning hit that tree. I remember lightning hit that tree, and every once in a while I would go over and check out where the lightning hit and see if anything started growing again, and the rest of the tree was fine, but it was missing a big chunk off the left side of this tree. But I just never would look at that tree the same way again. That tree got hit by lightning in front of my house. That could have been my tree in my front yard, but it was the one across the street. And that's a lot like God. When God and his miracles and his healing power does something supernatural in your life or somebody's life around you, you can no longer deny the existence of God. He is real. I've seen him show up and I've seen him show off. I've got more God stories than I've got time to tell you about. Because I'm looking for him. I'm open to him. I believe he exists. And he's showing, he's showing himself to me on a basis because I'm following his every step. I want to be as close as I can to be with him. But if you don't even believe he exists, he might as well be on the other side of the planet. And you're not going to talk to somebody you don't think is real. I don't spend any time talking to that wall, that wall, or that wall. But I spend time going up and talking vertical because I know he can hear me and I know he answers back. So at the end of the day, sometimes the revival just means, you know what? It's been a while since we talked. Just fire me up again. I need a fresh touch from heaven. I need to hear from your voice. I need to know where am I going? Am I going in the right direction? Talk to me. He's dying to talk to you. Let me rephrase that. He died to talk to you. And he says, you know what? I'll be back in three days. And he did. And he showed himself for over 40 days to over 500 people at once. The same Jesus who said, you're going to kill me and I'll be back like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. And he did. He came back to life. And that's, what, that's, the, that's the foundation of our, of, our, of our Bible. If you guys look at Romans 10.9 and verse 10.10, 10, 10, you guys have your Bibles with you? I want you to look at this verse. This is amazing. And this is a simple gospel message. He makes it really plain. Um, nowhere, you know, in order to be saved, and there was even a devotion yesterday, how to be saved, and today was don't lose your passion for God. If any of you follow my devotions, from Bob Gass, I didn't plan today, it was the, the topic was don't lose your passion for God. And he talked about that. But I want you to look at Romans, Romans 10, 9. A lot of people just use 10, 9 and they forget about 10, 10. John 10, 10, Jesus said, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, and that would be your faith. You can add that to your list as well as your physical body. Steal, kill, and destroy your faith. That's, and then he goes on and Jesus said, but I've come to give you life. Life abundantly, a full life, not a boring life, not a half-hearted, half-lived life, an abundant life. He came to give us. He's pro-life, but he is also pro-choice, and you'll be accountable for everything you do. You guys who follow me on Facebook, you probably saw last week when we were in New York City when the Roe versus Wade got turned around, and all these girls are, are marching around saying, pro-life, it's a lie, you just want women to die. Pro-life, it's a lie, you just want women to die. Pro and the more they kept chanting, I sat there and going, I'm not letting them do all the talking. I put my camera away and I just started talking to them. God loves you. You're wrong. He is pro-choice. But you know what? Cain and Abel had pro-choice and Cain killed Abel. And before he did it, God tried to talk to him. He said, hey, why did your countenance fall? Why are you so angry? Don't you know if you do well, you'll be accepted? But if you do, sin is at the door of your life, but you need to rule over it. He had a conversation with Cain before he killed his brother Abel. That was the first murder on the books. Adam and Eve's two, so, two sons, one killed his brother. Didn't take long for the first murder. And, you know, I understand my body, my choice. It didn't really apply with the vaccine too much. But, you know, we do have choice. And you'll be accountable for everything you say and everything you do. The Bible says that we're going to face the judgment seat of Christ to receive in the body everything we've done, good or evil. 
Not all roads lead to heaven, but all roads lead to the judgment seat of Christ. And the question God's going to ask you is, what did you do with my gift, my son, that I gave you? Did you re reject it or did you receive it? And if you rejected Christ, there's nothing else to talk about. Because there, no, there, no, there is no sin offering after the blood of Jesus. The whole animal sacrifice system was done away with 70 AD. The temple was destroyed. And for the last 2,000 years, it's nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash away your sin. If you don't have the blood of Jesus, you, know, you don't have a sin bill. So back to Romans 10. He says, in verse 9, he says, everybody have it? Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's what you're confessing. You're agreeing with God. Jesus is Lord. That means boss of the universe. And believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Nothing in this verse about asking God to come, Jesus to come live in your heart. There is a verse in Revelation where Jesus is talking to the church. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open up, I'll come into you and I'll, I'll dine with you. But that's not a salvation verse. Although we do believe Christ in us, the hope of glory. The whole New Testament talks about receiving the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But what saves you is your confession of your mouth. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified. If you believe this in your heart, you're justified. Which means just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I've never made a mistake. That's what justified means. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confession is is saved. What you believe and what you say, if that lines up that Jesus died for your sins, you're saved. And you still have a lot of issues. I have a t-shirt going around. I have issues that require tissues. Not as many issues as I used to have, but we all have issues that require tissues. But if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead and you confess through the mouth, Jesus is Lord, you are saved. Period. Before you even get baptized. Saved people do get baptized because Jesus commanded us to. Go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So once you believe it, now you're going to go make a public profession and go get baptized. The baptism doesn't save you. Your confession saves you. Period. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. Everyone who believes. Period. He didn't add anything in there. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing these riches on all who call upon Him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He over-explains it here, and it's Jesus plus faith plus grace plus nothing equals salvation. And a lot of people like to add performance to it. That word repentance does not mean you stop sinning. You will stop sinning certain things, but... Repentance means you change a heart and a change of mind. The way I look at God, I believe Him, I receive Him. A change of heart, change of mind. Then you'll start acting differently. Your performance will be. You'll stop sinning in certain areas. My pastor used to say this. You'll never become sinless, but you should start sinning less. And that's the grace card, folks. That makes a lot of preachers un unhappy and uncomfortable because they want their congregation to perform better. Your family want you to perform better. When we're talking about salvation, getting saved, it's all about believing and receiving, and that changes you over time. It's a process. We talk about that a lot. So sometimes in the Bible, they'll be, we'll be talking about the things of God, and somebody might walk in that may not have heard it, and they may have been skeptical, and they may believe a simple message, and God right there. God meets people right where they're at. Wherever you're at right now, God wants to meet you right where you're at. You could be a pig in the mud. And God wants to meet you there. And he's going to say, Come on, let's take a bath. Let's start over. You know if you're in the mud or not. You know if you're practicing sin or not. You know if you fell back into the mud. When a dog throws up his vomit, what does he do? Goes back and eats it again. Disgusting. Christians do the same thing. If your sin was vomit and you spit it up because God told you to, no one's looking. You go back and you eat your vomit again. There's a proverb about it. But the Holy Spirit that we receive gives us power to say no to ungodliness. Just because God said it's not good for you, even if I want to do it, I need to decide if I'm going to obey His commandment not to do it because I love Him or do what I want to do because it feels good. That's the battle every Christian on this planet has. It's on like Donkey Kong. The unbeliever who doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him, he's sinning like crazy and it doesn't bother him one bit. There's no conviction, no condemnation. He's just... He's a pig swimming in the mud, and he's happy. He's doing backstrokes in the mud. He, he ain't worried about it. But once you receive Christ, it's a different story. You're not going to be happy in your mud anymore. Let's go on to the next verse. Psalms 80, verse 18. 
Then we will not turn back from you, capital Y, he's talking about God. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. What did I just talk about? What happens when you call upon the name of the Lord? You'll be saved. Saved from what? Not just hell. Everybody thinks it's a heaven or hell issue. You, you, you might have a lot of years before you get to heaven or hell. I think He's saving us from stupid. Save me from my mistakes. Save me from going the wrong way, doing the wrong thing. Save me from making, you know, he's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a holistic salvation. He's saving you for something and to do something. When you save, when you go to the restaurant and you have your food and you can't eat it all and you ask the waiter or waitress for a box, is it because you don't want to throw it away? You can't, it just breaks your heart that the waiter's going to take the rest of this delicious food and throw it in the garbage back there? Is that why you're saving it? That's a second thought. It would be, a, it'd be this was so good, I'm saving it for later. I'm going to eat this later. I'm going to enjoy this later. God is saving you for something more than He's saving you from something. So He's not just saving us from hell. That's a great, that's a great, that's, that's good enough. I mean, who wants, I don't want my enemy to go to hell. But he's also saving you for good works. Ephesians 2.10, starting in 2.8, we've been saved by faith through grace. It's not of your works, lest anybody should boast or brag about it. Nothing you did to brag about it. But he says in verse 9, that, that you are, in verse 10, he says, you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God prepared from the foundations of the earth that you should walk in them. So God has a list of good things to do with you, and you don't have to do them. He's not going to make you do them. The devil can't make you do anything, and God won't make you do anything. The devil will try to talk you into doing the wrong thing. That's called temptation. And God will test you and sit back and see whether you do the wrong thing or not. But you will not be held accountable for everything you say and everything you do unless there was free will. And that's a choice. Either you're going to love God or you're not. Either you're going to serve Him and His people or you're not. You wake up every day and decide what you're going to do with every second, every minute of your life. You decide what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And you have to own every one of your decisions. Pro-life, pro-choice, your sexual immorality choices, all that. The lies, what I speak, what I say, what I do. Every idle word will be judged. And it's not a salvation judgment, it's a reward judgment. If you're saved, there's a whole lot going in there. But at the end of the day, sometimes people get so burdened with their sin and, not, and relapsing and continuing in the mud and they, oh, I just give up. I quit trying to quit. I'm the, you know, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they settle in that failure and they just need to be encouraged. No, you can find victory. Trust me. If he did it for this guy, he did it for this guy, he did it for you. He can do a few. Let's start over again right now. Revival! How many people started and ended their diet plan? How many people had a, a club membership to go work out? And used to go for a couple days and then quit going to work out. And so how many people have a club membership and they still paying for it and still haven't gone? I haven't been there in two months. I'm preaching to myself right now. I need to get up at 5.30 and go back to the gym. Same thing with being a Christian. I need to read my Bible. I need to pray. I need to be more like Christ-like. I need to work at this. The Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not a heaven or hell issue. You're not earning your heaven or hell issue. It's a salvation being delivered from Every sin that so easily ensnares us. In 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians says, there's not a sin that's uncommon to man. But with every sin, there's a door, there's a way out. Choice A, choice B. To sin or not to sin. It's never, you're never in a situation where you have to sin. That's your only choice. Uh, here's a multiple choice question. Blah, blah, blah. Do I sin? A, yes. No, there's a B, no, or E, none of the above, right? A, B, C, D. There's always a multiple choice. Do I, don't I? God will always make a way out. So that's what we're talking about. Call upon Him. And when you call upon God, things happen. When you start talking to God, things happen. He starts talking back. He starts showing you what you ought to do and what not do. And He loves you just the way you are. As is. But He loves you so much He doesn't want to keep you as is. So the bottom line is in Romans 8.28, He says, All things work together for good. For those who love God. For those who are called according to His purposes. Those He called, He predestined to be conformed into the image of His Son. To be more like Jesus. He predestined everybody to be more like Jesus. The question is, are you cooperating with Him in this process? Are you letting God conform you to be more like Jesus? Or are you missing action? MIA, running the wrong way. You know, that's, that's the ultimate question. Last verse, Proverbs 11.30. So as we do this revival, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to get pumped up, and we're going to take the circus. I call it a circus because there's a tent. 
And we're going to have music. We have live musicians. We have preaching. We're going to, we might have food on Thursday night to get people to come back and bring their friends. We need to talk about that as a church. And then Friday, there's another lady in Los Angeles. Her name's Simone Glue, and her husband Mike sold their cafe in Los Angeles because God told them to move to Gallup. And she's buying an 11-acre 11, 11 property with a rundown restaurant on, at the Rue. The Rue, am I saying that right? The Rue. The Rue. And she's <clears throat> buying that property, but she gave away her cafe. Here, you got the cafe. God called me to New Mexico. That's God. When God tells you to sell your business or even give it away and move to New Mexico to help, and she wants, she's building the First Nation, uh, First Native, First Nations Resource Center. So she's calling. God gave her heart for Navajo people. So we're partnering with her because she's going to be our Gallup connection. So we're going to go out there. God's calling Christians to Gallup. There's a big work that needs to be done here. We're going to sit here. We're going to praise them. We're going to, we're going to worship, and we're going to encourage one another. We're going to share testimonies. We're going to start high-fiving because God's about ready to show up. And somebody just driving by the tent and revivals nightly might stop by and hear good news because somebody picked the time, picked the place with a PA system, with a generator, power generator, with some food saying, God loves you. God loves you. I don't know what you heard or who you heard it from and how they said it, but I just want to say it the right way. God loves you and so do I. That's a game changer. You start loving on people, they change right in front of you. It's like, it's like ice melts when, they see, when it sees heat. Love is a game changer. We're going to love on people. We're going to start here. We're going to take it out. We've got all kinds of things God's going to have us do. And I'm just asking you, as our church, it starts here. It starts with us. If we get fired up and pumped up, yeah, that's contagious, not COVID. Love is contagious. Love changes things. If we start loving out loud, they can't turn us off. How do you love out loud? In word and deed. In word and deed. Out of 250 ministries I've interviewed over the last 15 years, every ministry was doing it in word and deed. They were helping somebody practically while they were telling them the scriptures and, and God's real message from his word. Not a twisted, perverted, contorted one, but a, a true, simple gospel message. The fruit of, a, of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. That's the fisher. Follow me. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. That's where we left off, right? The last time I was going through the Gospels. He said, who's heavy laden? Who's heavy burden? Come, come learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. My, my burden is light. Right? It's not hard to do this, but sometimes we put more on our plate than God even asks us to do. And we get all heavy burdened down and lay down because we, we put too much on our own plate. We add, we add more than what God's really expecting of us. And we get we tired. But... There's, you know, there's a lot of people right now, especially with Facebook and instant message and TikToking, and they're just texting their way out of relationships. They're offending people, saying things you wouldn't say somebody to your face because you'd get punched in the face if you said it to them face to face. But they're texting things. They're braver than they've ever been on the phone before, and they're not hearing your heart. He who wins souls is wise. You need to share the gospel and share your heart. Every 80% of what you say is your body language and your tone more than even the words you're choosing. I think you could say almost anything the right way if you, if you say it with love and your body language is right. But if you say it with a frown on your face and, you know, you know whatever, and it's body language, you could say the same thing, and it means something totally different. But so we're going to learn how to be soul winners. We're, we're, these are souls that may be destined for hell because they rejected God and his son Jesus because some Christian evangelized them wrong. The Native American people are probably the most evangelized people in the last 150 years, and most of them did it wrong because they tried to We're not trying to change anybody's culture. We're bringing Jesus into their culture. It's a big difference. So I've heard a lot of people who Then you have Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and just downright cults that are trying to, and even um, you know, Islam, you know, followers of Islam, bringing in false gods, false prophets, false religions. They've twisted the Bible and turned it into something else. Um, that's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. But anyway, there's this, you know, this, this isn't new. And I've been, you know, Lorinda and I was talking. She says, oh, they're used to the revivals. They've seen them before. This isn't something new. But as a church, are we going to pick a time and a place to say, hey, this week we're going to get pumped up ourselves, and this week we're going to go fishing for men and see what God does. We don't, he's doing the heavy lifting. We just need to show up and be available. And by next week, when this is over, we're going to have some 
stories. We're individually going to see some things, hear some things, encounter some people, and have a story. That testimony we'll all have. God showed up this way. These conversations happened. This was amazing. I met this person. This happened. This happened. We're going to have some God stories to start telling at work and start telling with the rest of your family. You start telling people about what God's doing, they get curious pretty quick because they, deep down inside, they want to see God moving in their life. Amen? All right, so that's the final verse. Follow me and I'll make you fish of men. Matthew 4, 19. That's our work. We've been doing Celebrate Recovery, so this Wednesday night, um, it's going to be outside. The revival's nightly, nightly 6.30 p.m., so we're just, it's just going to be a revival night. And you know what? On the flyer, and I'm going to ask you guys to come up and, uh, and pick up some. So we have, you know, some Fruitland, and, and again, keep them with you, especially when you go into a store. You're going to get a little prompting as you're checking out. You're going to look at somebody and God say, hey, tell them about the revival and give them a flyer. When God puts it on your heart to tell somebody something or give them a flyer, just do it. It's over in five seconds. It doesn't hurt that bad. Trust me. And you'll be happy after the fact that you did it. When you get those little promptings, hey, give them a flyer. Give them a flyer. Just be obedient in those little promptings. It's not going to be everybody you see. You're not going to be like, you know, like, a, like a Vegas dealer trying to deal cards to everybody you see. Every once in a while, you're going to get a prompting, and you're going to be surprised at the reaction. Oh, I was just thinking about that. Hmm. I didn't know that. He did, and that's why he prompted me. He's just asking me to hand out a flyer. Can you do that for me? God's asking you right now. Can, can you hand out a flyer or two for me this week? Can you invite somebody this week to come praise me, worship me, humble themselves, pray, seek their face? We'll talk about wicked ways and what we need to quit. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. Are you willing to be a voice for me? Are you willing to be an advocate? 2 Corinthians 5, we're, we're advocates, we're ambassadors for Christ. Every nation has an ambassador at the UN who's representing their nation when they sit around the big table. Every nation has an ambassador who's representing their country. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ, the one who's still alive. He's your, you're his hands, you're his feet, and he wants to borrow your lips and your vocal cords once in a while. Amen, amen? All right, so let's pray. For those who are watching online, Father, we just thank you that um, you never know who's watching, who's listening as we talk about these things, and we know, we've heard it before, people have done things, even with the best of intentions, but they've done poorly or just in the wrong spirit. We bruised a lot of fruit, but God, we want to bear fruit. We want to abide in you, you abide in us, and bear good fruit, fruit that remains. I love that, how you told us that in John 15, um, and how we break off branches that don't bear off fruit, and then you prune the ones that do, so they bear even more fruit. So we're just lifting up our hearts, our minds, and our bodies to you, say, Lord, Prune off the branches that aren't bearing fruit. And the ones that do so we might be more fruitful. I thank you for this house, our church members, our brothers and sisters in Christ. As we move into fellowship, God, I pray that uh, we'd enjoy, bless our time as we eat and fellowship and brainstorm and come up with ideas on what we can do to be a blessing to the people that we're going to encounter this week. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. One last song I want to play, and this song brought me to tears last time we played it. And... Um, It talks about revival in it. You can kill the streaming for me. God bless you guys. Thanks for watching.